colleagues, welcome. Uh, my name is Paul Mazarol. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor of Arts Education Law Griffith, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this wonderful opportunity to learn more about a fascinating project, the Prosecution Project. Um, I'd like to uh, begin by making a few acknowledgments. Uh, in particular, the Honorable Chief Justice Catherine Holmes, the Honorable Justice Ross Atkinson, AO, the Honorable Justice Martin Burns, the Honorable Justice James Douglas, Her Honor Judge Fleur Kingham, and Chief Magistrate Ray Renato. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. Uh, I'd also like to importantly acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which we gather this evening, the Turbo people and the Jagger people, and pay my respects to elders past and present, and extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us this evening to learn more about this very innovative uh, project, the Prosecution Project. Um, in a moment, um, Justice Holmes, Chief Justice, will, will introduce the team, but um, I think occasions like this are particularly important that we have a chance to learn a lot about a really innovative research project that is going to have impact. Uh, we know this is a well-funded project, it's a great team, it's asking big questions, and it has the potential to really share knowledge uh, from the past to the future. So I know that the further backwards we look in time, the further forward we are likely to see. So this is a significant project and event. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce the Honorable Chief Justice Catherine Holmes. Um, for those of you, um, I'm sure most people in this room would know that she's enjoyed a very long and distinguished career. Um, starting in um, uh, 1984, Justice, Chief Justice Holmes was admitted as a barrister at the Supreme Court of Queensland. She worked initially as the Commonwealth Crown Prosecutor from 84 to 86, and then she convinced, uh, commenced a practice at the bar in Brisbane. She took silk in uh, December 99, and she served as a founding member of the Women's Legal Service in 1984, a part-time member of the Anti-Discrimination Tribunal in 94 to 2000, and Deputy President of the Queensland Community Corrections Board in 1997. She uh, received her Bachelor's of Arts with Honours in 1989, and Master's of Laws advanced in 1998 at the University of Queensland. She was also a counsel assisting at the Ford Commission of Inquiry into the Abuse of Children and in Institutions in 1998-99, and she served also as the acting judge of the District Court of Queensland uh, from August 99 till November 99. March 2000, Chief Justice Holmes was appointed a judge of the Supreme Court of Queensland. She served as the, uh, the, the criminal list judge from 01 to 04, and the presiding judge of the Queensland Mental Health Court from 2005 to 2006. On, uh, in May 2006, she was appointed um, a judge of appeal, and importantly, in 2011 and 12, she conducted the Commission of Inquiry into the 2010-2011 Queensland floods. More recently, in 2015, um, Justice Holmes became Acting Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Queensland, and indeed, last September, she was appointed Chief Justice of Queensland Supreme Court. Ladies and gentlemen, please make welcome Chief Justice Catherine Holmes. I'm sorry you got the extended version of that. It was probably more information than you ever wanted. But anyway, thank you, Professor Mazarol. Um, I welcome everybody to the Banco Court this evening for the presentation by Professor Mark Vanane and the Prosecution Project team. The project is an Australian Research Council laureate project at the Griffith Criminology Institute. It involves the collection and digitisation of Australian criminal trial records from 1830 to 1960 across a number of jurisdictions. Professor Fanane and his team will tell us about the ways in which uh, the data being gathered by the project are being used to improve understanding of the historical criminal trial process in this country. Tonight's presentation is part of the inaugural Griffith PhD History Symposium, which is being held here in Brisbane this week, the theme for which is New Histories of Law, Power and Governance. Professor Fanane specialises in the history of policing, punishment, criminal justice and legal institutions. His team includes research fellows Dr Andy Caladelphus, Dr Yorick Smile, Dr Alan Piper and Dr Lauren Vogel, 
as well as PhD students Robin Bluer and Lisa Dernian and honours student Kelly Staunton. In addition to contributing to the project's database, Professor Fanane and his team are all engaged in their own research projects, looking at various aspects of the criminal prosecution process in Australia. Dr. Caladolphus, Dr. Smile, and Professor Fanane are the editors of a new book, The Sexual Abuse of Children, the product of their research on the prosecution of sexual assault offences against children. And Dr. Caladolphus has just published with her colleague, Lisa Featherston from the University of Queensland, their study, Sex Crimes in, in the 50s, on the policing, prosecution and punishment of sexual crime in 1950s Australia. The presentation tonight will give us all an opportunity to hear about the emerging, and I think enthralling, area of digital historical research. We'll be introduced to the valuable research that the project is doing and is capable of doing with respect to the history of the criminal trial in Australia. The team will be happy to take feedback uh, or questions from the audience at the end of the presentation. The work is obviously of interest to legal scholars, historians, criminologists and practising lawyers. The project recently celebrated the entry of its 110,000th um, trial committal entry, although as the minutes tick over, that may have gone up to 111,000th, uh, which makes it the world's largest repository of criminal prosecutions data. That's only possible because of the assistance and efforts of an army of volunteers from all over Australia and even overseas who are entering new trials every day. Some of those people are in, in attendance this evening and I welcome you particularly. But now I'll invite Professor Fanane to introduce the uh, project and his team. Thank you, Chief Justice. We're delighted to have this opportunity to introduce you and this audience to the prosecution project. Our original intention was perhaps that uh, it be a, a professorial lecture by me about the project, but um, we've had the opportunity recently to bring together the research from all the people on the team uh, in a very successful conference in Hobart called the Digital uh, Panopticon. And um, as part of that process, we uh, did a trial run of our respective uh, areas of interest. And we think that that will be of particular interest to this audience tonight. I'm pleased to say that the Chief Justices of all the uh, Australian jurisdictions which we are uh, working with uh, have all welcomed this project and been very supportive. But this is our first presentation uh, of the project hosted by Chief Justice, and uh, it's especially appropriate, of course, to be presenting in a venue that's most appropriate to the topic of our research. We're now in the third year of our data collection. This is a collaboration involving a large number of researchers and many others with an interest in the stories of the criminal law in Australia. Importantly, it's an Australian project. It's funded by the Australian Research Council and Griffith University. Our primary aim is to digitise the registers of the Supreme Courts for over 100 years, with lower level courts added uh, as we can uh, get to them. This is where we're at at the moment. And tonight's an opportunity to see what can be done with the knowledge made possible by such an extensive data collection as we are compiling. On this slide, we can see that the 100,000 cases, the 110,000 cases as it now is, uh, uh, so far collected, include, for example, more than 20,000 Queensland cases, about 50%, we think, of the total number of 
uh, committals to the Queensland Supreme Court uh, between 1850, when of course it was the, the Northern Court of the New South Wales Supreme Court, and uh, the mid-60s. This case data for Queensland includes, for example, details of the names, offences, committal dates and places, magistrates, uh, witness lists, bail record, the trial date and place, the name of the judge, the verdict and the sentence for those who were found guilty. Importantly, this project includes also those who were found not guilty. Um, and much of the historical work on criminal justice history uh, pays a lot of attention to those who were uh, convicted and then ended up in jail and about which we have a lot of data. This project is looking at the process from the point of arrest right through uh, to the end point of um, sentencing, uh, possible imprisonment, and even then uh, what happens to people afterwards. For the most part, the data is transcribed by the research team from digital images of the registers that were maintained by each Supreme Court going back as far as 1830 in the case of Western Australia. The task is labour intensive. That's why we've got a large team. No technology is currently capable of reading manuscript efficiently for our purpose. And so we've benefited enormously from the engagement of a large number of volunteers all over Australia, and we're very pleased to be meeting some of them for the first time tonight. Why are we doing this, and what would the data be used for? Our presentation will explore the potential of some of our data for looking at research questions that are legal, professional, historical, and criminological. Most importantly, the data is from the place we live in, Australia. We want to establish a robust and enduring database that will enable us to conduct a wide range of inquiries into the Australian development of the modern criminal trial. We want to replace the current models of research in our field, individualistic in mode, with limited data sharing and almost no verification of data sets. We want to replace this with an open data source that will enable a very wide range of research in criminal justice history. We want to displace the metropolitan bias of much work in our field. The presumption, for example, that it's enough to know what happened at the Old Bailey as a guide to the emergence of the modern criminal trial. The presumption that New South Wales, and especially Sydney, is the foundational history of Australian law. The presumption that the city trumps the bush because we know that the experience of criminal prosecution is discovered not only in the grandest Supreme Court building, such as this in Melbourne, but also in a remote colonial weatherboard, such as we find in Broome or any one of many, many courthouses around Queensland of this style. And the journey of those who end up being sentenced by a Supreme Court judge may begin not in the city watch house, but in a remote bush jail. And we know also from our data that those journeys may be experienced by individuals with or without mens rea, but they also have in our history been experienced by collectivities on whom the introduced criminal law weighed often heavily. The chained men in this photograph from a book to be published shortly by Western Australian researcher Chris Owen are among the many found in the pages of the register of the Western Australian Supreme Court that we've transcribed. Well, if you've not already encountered the prosecution project, it may be discovered on the web on our public homepage, which appears like this. There you will find information, including easily accessible short histories of the court jurisdictions in each state, a searchable index of our database names, dates and offences up to 1914, a blog where we present short commentaries on the data and on our research, and details of the research team and the project generally. This page is also the vehicle by which we recruit volunteers who are able to become involved by clicking on that little orange uh, box in the top right hand corner. <coughs> 
And that takes people, once they're registered, into this, a secure web page on which we manage the transcription of the records. This will be a very familiar image to our transcribers who may be here tonight. A split screen that includes a digital image of a court register page and a series of data boxes. The information from this digital image is transcribed into the structured forms and then saved into a relational database for later retrieval and editing. This process results in a unique record for each person who is committed to trial or for sentence in the Supreme Court. From here, we conduct further research into the cases using archival records, using the wonderful resource of the National Library's trove digitised newspapers, using Ostley's digital archive of law reports, or the equally rich repository of data in the Australian Police Gazettes. This searchable database will become a national record of permanent value, able to be used by researchers for quantitative study of the patterns of prosecution and punishment. It'll be able to be used by students needing to learn about crime, policing, prosecution and punishment. But importantly, and this is the basis of our appeal to the family and uh, community historians around the country who have come on board to help us with this project, Importantly, this database will be able to be accessed by general users who want to discover elements of their own family history or of local community history or simply about the stories of crime and society that are also part of the history of Australia. So today we want to give you some idea of the kinds of questions we're exploring with some focus on the trial as a legal process and some of its actors and decision makers. And we welcome later your questions about what we're doing at uh, the conclusion. Five members of our research team will talk about some aspects of the research. They are first Lisa Dernian. Lisa's a PhD scholar on the project, conducting research on the rise of the guilty plea in Australian criminal prosecution, a topic she's going to talk about. Second, Dr Alana Piper. Alana's a postdoctoral research fellow on the project. And her focus is on the prosecution of property crime, something that's been very neglected in criminal justice history, and which, of course, uh, makes up the great bulk of criminal prosecution in the periods we're talking about. Uh, she's going to talk today about what we can know about the role and impact of defence lawyers in the criminal trial. Our third, Dr Yorick Smile. Yorick's an ARC, DECRA Research Fellow, working on boys as victims and offenders in sexual offences, comparing historical data for Queensland and West Yorkshire. He's an affiliate of the prosecution project and today he will talk about witnesses. Fourth, Robin Bluer. Robin is a PhD scholar on the project and the only qualified lawyer among us, the only one who really knows a way around this building. She's researching the status of the child as witness in the courtroom but today she's going to talk to us about judges. And finally, Dr Andy Kaladelfos. Andy is also a postdoctoral research fellow on the project, working on the history of homicide and sexual offences. Today she'll talk about sentencing. So without further ado, I'm going to ask Lisa to talk to us about pleas. Thanks, Mark. Good evening, everyone. In Australian contemporary courts, most prosecutions for serious criminal offences are disposed of through guilty pleas, and full trials are relatively rare events. Historically, however, most defendants pleaded guilty and were convicted or acquitted by a jury. The shift away from trials as a primary means of case disposition towards resolution by the defendant's acknowledgement of guilt signals a fundamental transformation in the adversarial system. Yet we know relatively little about the origins and development of this process in Australian courts. The historical gu guilty plea literature is limited to a handful of in-depth case studies situated in the US jurisdictions of New York, Massachusetts and California. <coughs> 
The prosecution project provides the first opportunity for large-scale quantitative and interjurisdictional analyses of this transformation into the 20th century. When we look at the accelerating rates of guilty pleas in the Queensland and Western Supreme Courts, Western Australian Supreme Courts, we can see that the guilty plea shift in Australia is definitely a 20th century phenomenon. Between 1911 and 1936, guilty plea rates, seen here in green, fluctuated from 23 to 33% of all defendants' pleas across both jurisdictions. After World War II, however, the proportion of guilty pleas quickly accelerated. So by 1951, 54% of all Queensland defendants were pleading guilty. The rates continued to accelerate, and by 1961, almost 75% of criminal defendants were pleading guilty. At this point, I can only surmise as to the reasons for this sudden acceleration. The historical guilty plea literature correlates it with the development of plea bargaining. Some scholars argue that it was an administrative response to caseload pressure. Others suggest that lawyers' professional practices played an integral role. Public defenders, for example, were motivated to dispose of less lucrative criminal cases in favour of the better paid and more highly esteemed civil court work. This argument suggests then that defence lawyers were more likely to advise their clients to plead guilty and avoid a protracted trial. Sometimes this involved informal charge negotiations between defence counsels and prosecutors. In 1941 in Queensland, this pro practice became the focus of public and media attention following the Mackay Royal Commission. In November 1941, a defendant was committed for trial charged with the rape of a young Mackay woman. On the morning of the trial, his public defender, T. Barron, met with Crown Prosecutor John Quinn in the hallway corridor of the Mackay Courthouse. Some discussion ensued about the veracity of the victim's deposition statement. Barron gave his professional opinion that there were problems with her statement that he was willing to pursue should the case go to trial. The Crown Prosecutor asked if his client might plead guilty to indecent assault. The negotiation was accepted and the prisoner was subsequently sentenced to two years imprisonment with hard labour, an arguably lighter penalty than he would have received if he'd been convicted of rape. There was public outcry over the case, which quickly led to a royal commission. The, this commission offers some insight into the role of plea negotiations in Queensland at the time. The commissioner, Justice Mansfield, and the Crown Prosecutor in question, John Quinn, exchanged personal knowledge of the practice in terms of serious assault cases. Brisbane Crown Prosecutor, Joseph Sheehy, gave evidence as to the widespread nature of the practice to lesser offences. Ultimately, Commissioner Mansfield found that the Crown Prosecutor had committed no error in accepting the guilty plea. But this judicial approval of plea negotiations does not appear to serve as the catalyst for the rise in the overall number of guilty pleas in the Queensland Supreme Court post-1941. Between 41 and 46, the proportion of guilty pleas remained static, despite the increasing number of trials during this period. In fact, the timing of these guilty pleas shows that lawyers' negotiations were not the driving factor in the majority of guilty plea cases, or at least not those negotiations which might have been occurring in the Supreme Court. Rather, my research finds a much stronger association between guilty pleas and prosecution practices in the police courts. From 1946 onwards, the majority of guilty pleas were entered at the committal hearing. This raises interesting questions about the role and the significance of police in their investigating and prosecution activities in the lower courts. Perhaps plea negotiations were happening even before the defendant walked through the doors. Police magistrates may have indirectly influenced the defendant's decision to plead guilty during any one of the various lower court appearances that some Queensland defendants endured. And we cannot forget the role of defence lawyers in, the, in their defendant's decisions to plead. But the influence that lawyers played in defendants' early pleas remains to be seen. I'll now hand you over to Alana to discuss lawyers in more detail. While defendants had the acknowledged right to retain representation from the early 19th century, their ability to do so remained dependent on their personal circumstances and the type of offence with which they were charged. Until the 20th century, across Australia's various legal jurisdictions, only defendants charged with capital crimes were entitled to apply for state assistance in paying for representation. Defendants charged with murder and rape were therefore likely to be defended, 
But the majority of defendants, even at Supreme Court level, were charged with non-capital property crimes. Incipient legal aid schemes only began to emerge in the early 1900s, with Queensland and New South Wales enacting a Poor Persons Defence Act in 1907 and Victoria following suit in 1916. Part of the reluctance to institute legal assistance schemes can be traced to attitudes about defence lawyers themselves. Although the 18th century prohibition against counsel speaking for accused felons had been relaxed, into the early 20th century, there was a continued perception that the truly innocent had little need of a defence beyond what they themselves could simply and honestly state. Australian newspaper reporting suggests ongoing hostility towards the role of defence lawyers, which was perceived to be to secure an acquittal by any means necessary, no matter how legally tenuous. A multi-part expose by a journalist who went undercover in the Brisbane jail in 1883 thus complained of the presence of lawyers touting for business on the grounds, opining that money does a lot of things that the public knows very little about in the way of proving guilty men innocent. Prosecution project data allows us to assess the impact that this uneven presence of defence counsel in Australian courtrooms had across time. In short, did lawyers make a difference and for whom? A sample of Victorian criminal trials from across 1861 to 1961 suggests that while only half of defendants had counsel during the 19th century, the rate of representation rose considerably from the early 1900s. However, between a quarter and a third of sample defendants continued to be unrepresented at trial through to 1961. This is significant as legal representation was positively associated with more favourable outcomes for defendants. Of the 3,341 defendants tried by jury, 46% were acquitted overall. This rose to 56% with representation, but dropped to 28% for the undefended. The higher overall acquittal rate at trial evident in the 20th century may be partly attributed to the rising representation rate, as well as the increased number of guilty pleas weeding out the least defensible cases. While American scholars have associated the rise of the guilty plea with the growing presence of lawyers able to orchestrate plea negotiations, there was little statistical evidence of this in Victorian courtrooms, where pleading guilty was strongly associated with being undefended. Our data suggests that the association between representation and acquittal remains significant across different types of defendants, irrespective of such issues as race, sex, age, class, location of trial, or offence category. Although there were different outcomes for specific offences, in general it is very evident that being defended was associated with better prospects at trial. However, the presence or absence of representation had potential impacts for defendants on issues other than verdict. As legal scholar Malcolm Feely has explored, in the criminal justice system, sometimes the process is itself a punishment, especially if expensive or drawn out. At the turn of the century, an imminent barrister could charge as much as uh, 50 pounds for an appearance fee. This was beyond men like James Waters, charged with larceny in 1915, who earned four pounds a month as a grave digger, on which he had to support a wife and seven children. Although Waters was able to use his only asset, a dray, as security for the three pounds needed to employ a solicitor for his committal hearing, he was unable to afford a defence at trial, was convicted and sentenced to 12 months hard labour. Having legal representation also affected a defendant's trial process experience. It was associated with a longer mean time between committal and trial, especially in the 19th century. On the other hand, having a lawyer increased the likelihood of being on bail during that time. 83% of undefended accused remained on remand, twice the proportion of other defendants. While retaining legal representation could have financially and emotionally exhausting effects, for many the benefits probably still outweighed the drawbacks. Even when convicted, legal representation was strongly correlated with more favourable sentencing outcomes, particularly for property offences. For instance, among individuals convicted of breaking and entering, 47% of represented defendants were placed on bond or suspended sentence, compared to 26% of undefended accused. 
Likewise, of defendants convicted of stealing who were given jail terms, those with representation were sentenced to a mean term of 347 days imprisonment against 420 days for those without representation. There was less association between representation and sentence for those charged with crimes against the person. The exceptions were defendants convicted of homosexual offences or sexual assaults on underage females. Among these prisoners, having legal representation was strongly associated with a decreased likelihood of a prison term above three years during the 19th century and in the 20th century with an increased likelihood of a bond or suspended sentence. The significance of legal representation to verdicts brought against accused is perhaps not that surprising. The idea that the innocent did not necessarily need legal counsel within the English model of criminal justice relied on outdated understandings of the trial process in which defendants were confronted by victims, not the trained prosecutors of the adversarial system. Certainly not all defendants without legal counsel proved incompetent at raising doubts in the minds of the jury. For instance, in 1861, James Simpson was able to secure the acquittal of his wife and himself from larceny charges by cross-examining the complainant about his own criminal history and recent incarceration. Recidivist criminals may have become especially knowledgeable in the matter of legal proceedings and more likely to put forth an active defence. Other defendants, though, were clearly inhibited or overwhelmed by the legal process. Some prisoners neither cross-examined witnesses nor said anything on their own behalf. Others simply protested their innocence without offering any real defence. Then there were those who were described putting up an elaborate defence but offering no witness testimony to corroborate it. It was common for newspapers to make fun of the efforts of undefended prisoners to establish their innocence, regularly reporting them to have made rambling statements. Despite this, Judicial officers long continued to maintain the propriety of trying unrepresented defendants on the grounds that it was the judge's role to look after their interests and make sure the trial proceeded fairly. The prosecution project's records, however, suggest that undefended accused fared far less well in criminal trials. I'll now pass you on to York to discuss the evidence that was uh, used and discussed by lawyers. Thanks, Alana. <clears throat> the question of evidence poses problems for both the criminal law and history. For the law, it concerns what kinds of proof can be tested in the courts to support or refute allegations of wrongdoing. For history, the scope and reliability of the documentary record shapes our narratives and interpretations of the past. But what do we know about the history of legal evidence? that complex patchwork of admissibility, procedure, hearsay, confessions, cross-examination, character, similar fact, and corroboration. The rules of evidence in criminal trials were relatively simple until the late 18th century, when the principle of best evidence was generally the accepted legal standard. The Irish, statement, Irish statesman, Edmund Burke, is well known for his 1794 commentary on the topic. The laws of evidence, he alleged, and I quote, were very general, very abstract, and comprised so small a compass that a parrot he had known might get them by rote in one half hour and repeat them in five minutes. But change was on the horizon. The expansion and preservation of court reporting and the emergence of specialised works on evidence by commentators like Jeremy Bentham, John Henry Wigmore, and James Bradley Thayer prompted increased knowledge and specialisation. Legal treaties and case law inform much of our historical knowledge on evidence in the modern trial. Consider the problem of sex crime, for example. The majority of published law reports on those offences in Queensland over 60 years between 1870 and 1930 concern the problem of evidence. Questions of proof, admissibility, and corroboration, for example, dominate the considerations of the Court of Appeal. Occasionally, we have detailed newspaper accounts of unreported cases. In a matter, of, in a matter from 1927, for example, a conviction for the indecent treatment of a boy under the age of 14 was set aside in a unanimous decision 
after the appeals court found, quote, grave irregularities regarding inadmissible evidence and jury misdirection. Part of the problem was that one of the witnesses, a male youth of 15, was actually an accomplice to the crime and should never have testified at all. Added to the coverage in Trove, we are lucky enough in this instance to have the appeal transcript itself, which sets out the issues of evidence in detail. But appeals cases, no matter how well, how well documented, are the exception rather than the rule. And it is here that the prosecution project offers promising potential to ask new questions about the general reliability of courtroom testimony. At the heart of this inquiry sits the witness, those individuals and experts who testified in court about what they saw and what they knew. There is a rich historiography on sexual violence and sexual cultures that reveals how this evidence is given procedurally and what it might tell us about contemporary attitudes and behaviours. Less is known about the quantum of witnesses across particular offences or in particular periods and its relationship to social regulation, the legal persuasiveness of particular volumes of evidence, as well as patterns of prosecution. The trial registers in Queensland, as well as in the state of Victoria, provide rich data on the names and number of witnesses, and in some cases, their professional status. Using this information from a sample of 1,234 sex crime trials against adults and children, we can begin to think about the problem of evidence in new ways, stepping beyond the traditional approaches that read individual testimonies alongside case law and procedure. The data reveals a widespread of witnesses across sexual matters ranging from two to 20 individuals. The mean is just under six witnesses and the median is five. Histograms suggest a division between four and five witnesses and I've created three categories based on this distribution to undertake my analysis today. Two to four witnesses, five to nine witnesses and 10 witnesses or more. When we chart these categories over time, we see an upward trend in the number of witnesses who appear before the courts. While the presence of one to four witnesses account for around half the trials in the 1870s, this had dropped to less than 30% by the end of the century. Trials involving five to nine witnesses jumped from 48% of all matters in the 1870s to almost 70% by the 1920s. Put another way, the average number of witnesses increases from 4.9 in the 1870s to almost six and a half in the 1900s. This shift can be explained at least in part by changing legislation. Creation of new offences against young girls in the 1890s and crucially requirements for corroboration brought larger numbers of crimes and witnesses before the courts. But regardless of potential drivers for change, the volume of witnesses appears to have had little uh, effect on the disposal of cases. Around 50% of defendants were convicted no matter how many people testified against them. This suggests on a cursory reading that the quality rather than the quantity of testimony carried most weight for judges and juries. This confirms what we already know for sexual offences. Feminist scholars have well documented that a victim's character was a central consideration for all male juries in allegations of sexual assault. And convictions in cases against children probably proceeded on other elements of proof, notwithstanding the need for corroboration. Proof of age was certainly critical with birth certificates or records of births in family Bibles accompanying the depositions. Gender and age structure the number of witnesses in more significant ways. The figures reveal higher volumes of witnesses for crimes against females than for males, and for children than for adults. Sex between consenting adult males, for instance, was observed in flagrante delicto by police or passers-by, leaving only a handful of witnesses to testify in about half the cases. A small number of witnesses also appear in a substantial number of crimes against young males. Two to four witnesses were twice as likely to appear in trials for assaults on boys as girls, suggesting very different circumstances of observation and intervention for the contamination of young males by older members of their own sex. Beyond statistics, the prosecution project allows us to consider evidence and witnesses in other ways. Witness lists might be used to ask critical questions around the effects of changes in the late 19th century 
to the rules of incompetency, which finally allowed defendants and their spouses to testify in court, as well as the frequency and distribution of Indigenous witnesses in criminal trials, an area of significant concern for inquiries on the policy and practice of colonial settler law. As the development of digital databases like the Prosecution Project continue to grow in scope and detail, they provide opportunities to examine questions of evidence beyond the confines of case law and precedent. The qualitative and quantitative potential of these projects allows us to apply large-scale data to the problem of evidence, to examine the circumstances in which witnesses intersect with particular crimes. Beyond this very brief account of sexual offences in Queensland, others might begin to compare different types of offending across different jurisdictions at different moments in time to discover what witnesses might tell us about the historical and procedural dimensions of the criminal trial. Thank you. So now, I'll hand over to uh, my colleague to discuss judges. Former Chief Justice of the High Court, Sir Gerard Brennan, once described the Australian judiciary as the least dangerous branch of government. Historically, Sir Gerard said, judges were revered as symbols of justice. Because of this significant role that judges play in our legal system, data regarding the lives and careers of members of the judiciary is relatively easy to come by. Newspaper reports, judges' notebooks, biographies, books and the like, provide us with a wealth of information about judges and as individuals and as a branch of government more broadly. As you may be aware, Sir Gerard Brennan's father was a former Queensland Supreme Court judge. Justice Frank Brennan was hearing a trial in 1936 when a young girl was called as a witness. According to newspaper reports, the child was crying hysterically. Justice Brennan said it must leave a terrible mark on a child's mind forever to have to come into court like this. It would be another 60 years before psychological research demonstrated the accuracy of Brennan's intuition. A search of historical newspapers on the Trove website reveals numerous cases in which Frank Brennan's decisions received widespread attention. A case of note, in 1945, revealed his unusual versatility in communicating with a witness in sign language. The following year, in 1946, a truth headline read, Judge Breaks New Ground in Notable Case. Two men, described as herbalists, had been convicted of abortion. But rather than send them to prison, as would ordinarily have been the case at the time, Brennan issued them with significant fines. The only way to stop such illegal operators, he said, would be to take money off them. The historical study of judges and judge craft has largely involved examination of newspaper reports like these ones, biography, and of course, their written judgments. There has been very little quantitative data with respect to their decision-making patterns. But quantitative data would add an interesting and important dynamic to such study. How many criminal cases did Justice Brennan hear? Where did he hear them? What sentences did he hand down? To obtain such data, researchers would previously have had to undertake the painstaking and protracted work of trawling through the archives. But using data collected by the prosecution project, I was able to extract details of all, as far as we know, of Justice Brennan's criminal cases from the database in less than five minutes. 583 cases between 1925 and 1947. Using the criminal code categories of offences, the majority of these were property offences, followed by offences against the person and offences injurious to the public which included indecency offences like incest and indecent treatment of children. For most of his career, he was based in central Queensland, and we know he heard matters in Longreach, Barcaldon and Warwick, as well as Brisbane and occasionally elsewhere in the state. 
Such data can help us better understand Justice Brennan's caseload. But what might also be useful to know is how his sentencing practices compared to those of his fellow judges. Again, if we think about doing this pre-prosecution project, this would have taken longer again to collect the details of yet another set of cases necessary to undertake such a comparative study. Instead, in another few minutes, I was able to extract similar data from the prosecution project database in relation to Supreme Court judge and later Chief Justice, Sir William Webb. Appointed to the Supreme Court bench within weeks of each other in 1925, Webb and Brennan both sat on the court until 1946 when Webb was appointed to the High Court. Looking again at Trove, Justice Webb also drew press attention for some of his decisions. In 1935, the Queensland Times reported on his sentencing of a man for assaulting a police officer. Prior to making his orders, Webb discussed the proposed sentence with the defendant. He issued a suspended prison sentence and required the defendant to pledge that he would not drink alcohol for the duration of the sentence. In 1939, the Truth newspaper reported on a domestic violence matter in which Webb declared the defendant too dangerous to be at large. Even though his honour thought that jail would do the defendant no good, he ordered an immediate prison sentence on the basis that the protection of the man's family had to be considered. Given these press reports, it might appear that the two judges had similar approaches to their sentencing practices. Analysis of project data, however, suggests otherwise. Webb was appointed Chief Justice in 1940 and was on leave for much of the war. So for the purposes of this discussion, I have limited the comparison to between 1925 and 1939. During this period, Brennan heard 352 cases compared to Webb, who heard 234. Webb's role as president of the Queensland Court of Industrial Arbitration between 1925 and 1946 may go some way towards explaining this difference. But it is nevertheless the case that Justice Brennan would have heard over 100 more criminal matters during this period than Webb, which may also explain some of the differences in their sentences. For example, Brennan was nine times more likely than Webb to give non-custodial sentences and 30 times more likely than Webb to give alter alternative or unorthodox sentences, for example, convicting but not further punishing the defendant. When ordering suspended sentences, Brennan imposed longer prison terms than when he ordered immediate imprisonment. And when he did order immediate imprisonment, Justice Brennan imposed longer terms than Webb did, on average, two and a half years compared to just two years for Webb. My far more numerous colleague, Dr. Lauren Vogel, was able to analyze the Brennan and Webb data even further. Notwithstanding the fact that these men were hearing trials at the same time in the same jurisdiction based on the same sentencing principles and trial procedure, the data indicates a strong relationship, at least for these two, between the judge and the sentence imposed. This data tends to raise as many questions as it answers, and I'm mindful that in, every case, in all the cases that Justices Brennan and Webb heard, there would have been different circumstances. The quantitative data analysis, though, adds another layer to our understanding of how Justice Brennan would have approached his job as an individual judge. Going beyond thinking about individual judges, such data might, might also challenge the traditional view of judges as a group who applied the law predictably and consistently. I will hand you over to Andy now, who will add a final chapter to our presentation by demonstrating a further approach to the analysis of sentencing data. Thanks very much, Robin. Um, so we come to the end of the trial process here with looking at sentencing. Most criminological studies of sentencing have by and large been primarily concerned with the accused 
with their age, with their sex, their criminal history, potential mental impairment as factors that they analyse that might influence judges' sentences. Tonight I'm going to use the prosecution project data to explore other possibilities of factors that might have influenced sentencing, especially examining the relationship of victimisation to sentencing. The data that I'm going to discuss tonight is part of a longitudinal study of the historical prosecution of child sexual abuse that Mark Yorick and I are currently working on. In designing that study, it was critical that we would identify the sex and the age of the complainants. But as you've seen from the raw data in the registers of criminal indictments that we work with in this project, and as the volunteers would know, that does not include any data on victims. For some sexual offences, we might be able to tell the sex of the victim or their age from the uh, offence. For example, rape was a charge historically that, that could only be laid in the case of female victims. And carnal knowledge was another charge that could only be laid for offences against girls under a certain age, uh, mostly 16. But for offences such as indecent assault, we simply do not know either the age or the sex of the victim. Um, and so what Yorick, Mark and I have done is cross-referenced every sexual offence with material from the Trove Digital Newspapers, from the official police gazettes, from archival depositions in those cases to identify the age and sex of complainants. It's a lot of work and it took us two years. <laughs> um, so we now have case level data for more than uh, 4,000 sexual offences from the 1830s to the 1950s. And that's what I'm going to talk about today, focusing particularly on Western Australia and Victoria. So I wanted to look at this data in relation to sentencing. And so what I did first was uh, recategorise all the various sentences down into four um, categories. The mandatory sentences, death sentences or life sentences for sexual offences, any term of imprisonment, um, any other custody, which includes being sentenced to an asylum or another type of reformatory, um, and non-custodial sentences. And by non-custodial sentences, I mean good behaviour bonds, suspended sentences, probation or fines. When I graphed this data over time, I was really interested in the uh, mid-20th century change that you see on the right-hand side of that slide, the increasing use of non-custodial sentences. This change is uh, moderate in Western Australia and it does actually rise quite dramatically in the 60s in that state. In Victoria, however, the changes are pretty extraordinary. Non-custodial sentences go from about a third of all sentences in the 1940s for sexual offences to 81% during the 1950s. In other words, during the 1950s, they eclipse prison sentences. So most people are not being sentenced to a prison term. Um, in both states, there's a very minor increase at that same time of indefinite sentences. Um, meaning other, other, other types of custody. The growth of both non-custodial and indefinite sentences relate to the growing individualisation of punishment in the 20th century, which saw judges being able to take into account the criminal's individual circumstances, meaning their crime, their criminal history, their social and their mental background. They could take those into account now in determinations, particularly um, with a decrease of um, mandatory sentences, particularly death sentences. Um, historically, of course, there was no statutory provisions such as sentencing acts that regulated the influence of those factors as there are today. So why is this change to um, non-custodial sentences important? Well, this trend that um, I found through prosecution project data towards non-custodial sentences doesn't match at all with what we thought we knew about sexual offences in this period. In the post-war period, historical scholarship has emphasised what they've described as the punitive nature of sentencing after the introduction of sex psychopath legislation and characterises this period as one of a sex crime panic. And you can see that the um, top example there is a, is a newspaper account of that type. But in Australia, I've really found a disillusionment from judges over the lack of sentencing options available to them and a reticence to sentence some sexual offenders to prison terms where they thought there was no possibility of reform and where judges thought prison would create more hardened criminals. And that's an example that you see down the bottom of that slide. So from this point, um, I wanted to find out what was driving this change towards non-custodial sentences and whether it related at all to victimisation. So I looked at non-custodial sentences in relation to victimisation and I found that in both states they had the same trend. 
After the 1930s, non-custodial sentences came to be used near exclusively for two types of sexual offences. Offences involving adolescent female complainants and offences involving homosexual males. So what this means is that at the same time when there's a moral panic about homosexuality, for example the New South Wales Police Commissioner calling homosexuality the greatest menace to society, there was a greater use by judges of good behaviour bonds. And at the same time, when there was rising arrest rates, rising in some states 450% for sexual crimes against underage girls, the courts are imposing more bonds than ever before. Western Australia sees moderate increases, but again, Victoria, this change is very notable. Non-custodial sentences for crimes against girls under 18 go from a third to 70% of sentences in the 1950s. For those involving homosexual men, they go from 13% in the 1940s to more than 62% in the 1950s. That is, by the 1950s, the majority of both types of those cases ended in a non-custodial outcome. But why would judges impose non-custodial sentences in these particular cases? Well, I can hypothesise um, some of the reasons at this stage, and I'll look at it more in depth in, in some case studies um, in, in future research. But perhaps this is relating to characteristics of the, the offender. Maybe it's their youth. Maybe it's the fact that these are first-time offenders. Is it their perceived good character? Is it their perceived ability to rehabilitate? Perhaps this sentencing related to factors about the complainant. What was the role of sexual consent in these cases? Was the victim blamed for the crime and thus punishment seen as unnecessary? Or were these cases seen as somewhat victimless crimes in the case of consensual, although illegal, sexual activity? Perhaps it was disillusionment with the prison system overall, especially in relation to homosexual cases, where many people saw the prison as a place of contagion, in fact, creating further um, homosexual men, as they thought at the time. Case analysis will reveal more of the answers to those questions, but what I wanted to show you today is some of the benefits of linking these long-term trends in sentencing to victimisation and how this challenges what we think we know about historical sentencing. Firstly, that historical research has devoted a lot of attention to the introduction of indefinite sentencing in the 20th century, but it's paid very little attention to the equally if not more significant trend to impose non-custodial sentences at the same time. Could it be that judges were exercising discretion in sentencing while there was a growing public pressure on governments to develop more punitive punishment regimes? Secondly, sentencing studies, as I started with, generally look at the characteristics of criminals themselves, their criminal history, their socioeconomic position as predictors of sentencing trends. But here I've showed that the importance of victimisation in sentencing and how this can yield new knowledge about patterns and rationales who the victim was mattered historically to the sentences that judges handed down. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Andy, Robin, Yorick, Alana, and Lisa. Um, I trust you've got a good sense now of the tremendous potential of this research not only to access important stories about crime and society, but really uh, potentially to turn upside down some of our uh, preconceptions about the way in which criminal trial, policing and prosecution has developed over time. And I think uh, Andy's counterposing of, of um, the role of victims and the convicted in understanding the sentencing patterns is a really good example of that. So we have a chance uh, for a few minutes for questions before we break. Um, if you are going to ask a question, can you just wait for a, a roving mic as uh, we're recording this session for the benefit of our people who are not here tonight? Yes. Are there any questions? Thank you. Um, well, that uh, the Kircher 
reports, of course, have been um, a, a completely original. Uh, I mean, I have um, known that project from its beginning, a major work of recovery of early Australian colonial legal history. Um, what's different, of course, about our project is that it's not focused um, uh, on the uh, nature of legal reporting per se, but on the criminal justice process from the point of arrest right through to its outcomes, various as they may be. Um, so I'd say the primary difference between our two projects is that his has uh, a bent towards the legal historical side, ours I think more towards the criminological historical side. So I, I think uh, our presentations will have um, uh, referred to the kind of the debt we owe to the questions that, about uh, the criminal justice process that have arisen within generations of research in criminology, but which have been very poorly understood in history. But of course, um, the Kircher reports are as well a resource for us. Uh, they're some of the background to our studies and we access them as well for our understanding, particularly of those early periods. For Queensland, for example, we will be, um, we're currently transcribing data going back into the 1850s um, and some important collecting has already do been done about uh, recovery of the legal reports uh, that are represented among the Kircher archive. Thanks. Hi, uh, it's Mark Lox from the QUT. Um, I'll just say first that I'm very jealous of everyone's projects. I think they're fantastic and I think they're all really remarkable work. Uh, I do work on current court decisions and judgments. Is there any intent to digitise the actual documents themselves going back historically as well? Yes. Um, we're currently in uh, the second phase of our um, website development and one of the aspects of that phase is the development of a capacity to transcribe um, the textual record of these cases. So as I've emphasised, we're trans digitising the line by line register data, really the metadata for the cases. Um, but uh, the research we've already discussed is referring to data about those cases that we get from um, archive mining, um, including access to depositions, trial transcripts and so on. We already have um, a couple of major collections of deposition materials, um, uh, particularly for Western Australia. We're about to acquire one for Queensland uh, through uh, the Queensland State Archives, the whole of the northern uh, jurisdiction files for, for maybe 80, 100 years. Uh, that, those two big collections will provide tremendous resource for us to, to really um, do the kind of work that you're talking about. As well as that, um, the digitised newspapers of Australia, particularly up until the 1950s, are a priceless record of uh, law and society. Uh, court reporting in the 19th century was you know, the, the uh, bread and butter of newspapers and it was part of the daily fare of those who read newspapers or had them read to them. You can, you've only got to look at those papers to see how important the records of the courts were. And we do a lot of work with those records. Uh, in fact, our database is uh, structured to, in a uh, semi-automated way to access the Trove uh, archive in order to attach those reports to our cases. Um, yeah, thanks very much. Um, 
project, where the Leeds Panther Project also shows the blind spots, the silences, and the gaps. And you know, there were just a few comments all the way through about you know, the things that we still have to surmise, or the fact that Indigenous people couldn't give evidence. What kinds of absences and gaps are you finding? Um, are, being, are being sort of revealed, I guess, by the capacity of these kinds of projects to produce something that feels like a complete Okay, th thanks, Anna. That's um, a very good question um, that, as you've alluded to, I think we've sort of touched on that in some ways. I mean, Andy's discussion of the retrieval exercise that we have engaged to uh, recover the uh, ages and sex of victims of sexual offences um, is uh, an attempt to um, uh, replace the gap, the silence, with um, real data and, and information that's, as we can see, is relevant to understanding the cases. There are other aspects of the record which, um, you know, you've only got to look at a register page of the uh, prosecution of masses of Aboriginal defendants for cattle stealing or cattle killing in the Kimberley between 1900 and 1910. Uh, to be able to infer an entire uh, colonial history there, to look at the way in which the law was being actively used uh, to displace Aboriginal possession of the land and to deal with Aboriginal resistance uh, and to establish a new economy. And uh, some of those pages, I haven't shown them here tonight, but. Um, in contrast with the, the digital image on the uh, page that we showed you from the register where you can see the kind of complex array of details about cases. It's coming up somewhere. Yeah, there. In contrast to that, what you get in the Western Australian depositions is uh, an exercise book with a whole lot of Aboriginal names down the side, a date of the committal, a date of the trial, uh, a plea and a result, nothing else. Um, and uh, that speaks to a silence, but it's also evidence of um, a whole process that's a very important part of the history of the Western Australian Supreme Court that we are mapping. We might have time for just one more from Bill. How searchable is this database now and will it be in the future in terms of by specific people, by families, for example? Yeah. So would you be able to find out if some of those sons or daughters were also more likely to be involved in criminal activity or not? That sort of detail? Uh, yes, potentially. Um, the, uh, those who, and after this you'll have a chance to have a look on uh, laptops that are going to be available outside provided by the Supreme Court Library. Uh, you can have a look at the database. Um, currently we only allow access to the names, dates, offences, uh, jurisdiction. Um, but the next phase that I've spoken about uh, will extend the range of data we're going to make available. And um, we already know from the inquiries we get from people looking for family members uh, how important this data is. Uh, people have discovered things already from uh, that data. Uh, I had a, an email a couple of weeks ago from somebody in Tasmania who discovered that two uh, crucial relatives of, of hers from the 1850s um, had popped up on this uh, random search she did. She knew nothing about their history. Uh, interestingly, they, they turned out to be part of the family of a later Tasmanian Premier. So there'll be all sorts of stories that this day uh, might make possible. Um, we've had one of our volunteers who, in the course of um, transcribing, became very aware of the e experiences of the people whose uh, lives she was transcribing. And, and how they compared with the history that she knew about her early convict ancestors. And in fact, with Alana, she's written up a story about that that's on our, on our blog. Uh, 
Um, so I think the database is going to be a very important uh, community resource uh, of another kind beyond the criminological kind of research that uh, we're all engaged in. Thanks. Well, uh, as I said, we've got a chance uh, to have conversation and, and further discussion afterwards. Um, before we wrap up, I'd just like to extend uh, some thanks um, tonight. I first of all want to thank the Supreme Court Library for the tremendous welcome we've had. David Bratch for the librarian and, and corporate support manager, Miriam Moss, have been uh, tr tremendously supportive of this event and all those staff who've come along tonight. I'd like to thank uh, the organisers of the Griffith University PhD History Symposium uh, who proposed this event, and especially Robin, who's brought her professional experience to the event uh, to ensure excellent communication between our project team and the Supreme Court and the Office of the Chief Justice. And we remain in continuing debt to Melanie Davies, our project officer who's here tonight as well, uh, who keeps track of what we're doing and has used a great variety of skills, uh, particularly to enable the digital project to advance so smoothly. And she's our indispensable broker uh, with the project volunteers. Uh, thanks, Melanie. I want to thank other Griffith University staff for their continuing support to the project, including the Pro Vice Chancellor, Paul Maserol, here tonight, and also the Director of the Griffith Criminology Institute, Professor Ross Coomer, who's also with us tonight. And finally, um, we appreciate deeply the interest shown by Chief Justice Kate Holmes. At a time when there's continuing debate within universities about connecting our research to the world outside, it's invaluable to us to have this opportunity to present our work here at the Supreme Court, which is uh, the place about which we uh, conduct our research. Uh, but much more than that, uh, it's been very important to us to have the Chief Justice to host the event and to mark the occasion, I hope we can offer this small gift to you. Right. <laughs>